Our hero Rick Grimes must reunite with his family and take down the blood plague that's taken over Cascade Hills. Rick's got himself a firework powered little runaround. This is exactly the car Rick Grimes would drive around in in State of Decay, I'll have no arguments in the comment section, alright? There's an enclave set up near Rick's home and he decides to go and check it out. And that enclave is called The My Family. It's an enclave of three featuring Shane Walsh, Laurie Grimes and Carl Grimes. But unfortunately we can't reunite due to my crippling lack of influence in the region. So we better get busy you rather sharpish before Judith Grimes makes an appearance, if you know what I mean. But first I need a repair kit to fix up this battered piece of shit. So I arrive at Seconds Auto Repair Shop and almost immediately get bitten by the first zombie we come across. This whole one bite kills thing is going to give me a bloody heart attack. You too will learn to fear the lunge. Not wanting to become immediately overrun, for once I keep my pistol holstered and head out the back door. And thankfully Rick can seriously carve up a walker with his hatchet. And with them all gathering in the garage, is only really one thing I can do. Fire in the hole! I know you've never seen Rick use a molly in the show, but I guess in this universe he's a massive pyromaniac. I guess that would also explain the firework car, which I'm able to fix up after finding a toolkit in that garage. Now it's time to get to work so we can earn some bloody influence. Rick agrees to meet up with Sasha who's looking for a backup buddy, and they set up in a corner office in the middle of this little town. And I'm not saying she's creepy or anything, but she's literally waiting at the door for me. I know we aren't exactly buddy buddy, but I need some backup while I search the outdoorsy house nearby. Yeah. Oh my god, we were just there, man! You know valuable fuel is in this economy? In case you missed it, that was an enclave of eight named the Survivors. And they are currently neutral towards me, so it would require 1500 influence to recruit one of them. But by helping them, they should become friendly and that'll help me save some Wonga. So it's proper important that this mission goes well, and we get this community off to a good start. So I enter the little house, and judging by the mini-map, there's six zombies in this building. And that's no problem for Police Sheriff Rick Grimes, who can carve up these walkers with his cheeky little hatchet. However, that six has quickly multiplied and Rick didn't bring himself any wraith energy. And you can get 10% by using code JTalbert at checkout, linked in the description below. Rick then finds himself in the bathroom with hordes approaching and wanting to keep Sasha alive, he does the only thing he can. But what's a simple third degree burn between friends? Somehow that's attracted even more zombies to our presence and Sasha is extremely chill about the situation. But after taking massive damage from a simple backhander, Rick throws himself out of the window. I then get bored of this hand to hand shite and just whip out the pistol. But thankfully we've only got 5 more seconds until the mission completes. No! Sasha! Unfortunately, Sasha has been bit and will not be joining us on the rest of this adventure. I don't even have chance to put her down as the hordes very quickly overwhelm me. Oh, no, 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 Jesus. Run, Rick, run! And now we have a bloody big horde between us and our getaway car. So I lead them on a little trek and double back on myself. And at that point, the crowds are dispersed enough for me to get back into the car and safely make my exit. After that, I decide to pay a visit to the Dixon brothers who are just set up around the corner. Oh, hang on. No, they're not. Apparently, Daryl and Merle have disappeared. They were down here, I swear. I guess the Dixons heard the sheriff was in town and his last mate didn't make it out alive. And at this point, Rick is starting to get a bit sleepy, but there's no rest for a single man during the zombie apocalypse. So I rock up to the local swine and bovine and make it an outpost. I can then grab a cup of coffee from my storage locker, but unfortunately, that doesn't fix me up as much as I thought it would. I then get a message over the radio. Hey, sheriff, we need help out here right away. Move to the home of the villagers. All things get out of control. Who are they? I don't even know who they are. But being the Sheriff Rick can't just turn away from people in need. And he also needs currency in order to buy his wife and kid back from his former best friend. The villagers have been attacked by some hostiles and it's my mission to save them. And being the absolute beast he is, Rick flatlines them without a second's thought. Now all I need to do is talk to William to complete the mission and I can collect my influence. Which thankfully I'm able to do before the hordes are attracted to my gunshots. He was even nice enough to give me a rucksack of pizza for my troubles. I'm even able to loot the dead guys and sell this stuff back to the villagers. Oh shit, I didn't want to sell that. I wanted that. That was my Rick Tater gun! I'm gonna have to buy it back. Definitely not a great use of my influence when I'm trying to buy back my family. And after all that wheeling and dealing, I've now got a thousand influence to my name. And with no mission spawning, I pop back in to see the survivors to see how they're coping with the loss of Sasha. But to be honest, it doesn't seem that they're that bothered because they'll happily sell me a toolkit to fix up my pyro hole. I then meet Maggie, Glenn, Tyrese and Michonne. But seeing as they've got nothing for me to do and there's no mission spawning, the only thing I can do to earn influence is taking on a play card. I am Rick Grimes. I am all already tired, I'm already injured, and I've got no way of resting. All I can do is crack on until I earn enough influence to recruit someone and give Ricky Boy a rest. So Rick has never faced a play cart, remember chat, alright? So this is like, you know, it's, it's a learning process. He parks up strategically and jumps through the window. Then starts taking out the zombies in the kitchen, but it's not too long until the horde catches up with him. But hey, at least he manages to get one hit on the play cart. But after that, it's time to quickly exit through the back door like a dodgy takeaway. So we loop around the front of the house, temporarily losing the horde. I can then run back into the 
the kitchen to get a couple of hits with my hatchet. But this is a really ineffective way of taking on play cards. Honestly, you've got a better chance of hoping the wind takes out than using a bladed weapon. Okay, just gotta keep moving, I think. If I keep moving, we should be okay. I slice up one, close the back door, then go to town on the play cart. And as soon as the back door bursts open, I drop back and drop another molly. So I once again do my bit to loose the hordes, then go full auto on my AK. And that finally completes the first phase. I can even put the rest of my mag in before the horde catch up to me. From here, I can climb onto my car and finish the job with my sidearm. Kind of have quite a few zombies around us, chat. How am I getting out of this then? I'll tell you exactly how, but by just fucking legging it. I try looping through the house to try and lose them, and when that doesn't work, I even try entering the detached garage. Oh god, oh that was a lot of zombies in there. I was hoping to take refuge. That's not happening. Oh my god, look how many zombies there are. This is fucking mental. All I need right now is to get into my car and get the fuck out of here. And look, I'll be 100% honest, my escape definitely could have been cleaner. But at the end of the day, I didn't get bit and the car's still running. Oh, shit. Well, that's not good. So I throw myself from the vehicle before it can explode. But now we're in a very perilous situation. Sure, I can outrun the little bastards, but that's only going to have a negative effect on my fatigue. Thankfully, our boy Rick is one cardiovascular son of a bitch. Thankfully, I can jog back to that little town without any issues. But before we can sort out a new vehicle for ourselves, Rick has to complete some more sheriff duties. Unfortunately, though, when I get to the home of the villagers, I have kind of dragged along a horde with me. And that only gets worse when I whip out the pistol and start popping headshots. But I have no choice but to fight. I have no quick escape and if I don't take down this horde, these two bickering enclaves will get munched on, just like Sasha did. And you might recognise the name of the guy I currently have to interview. So this is now important for two reasons. Not only will I get influence for completing this mission, but by siding with Eugene, his enclave, which includes Rosita and Abraham, will hopefully become friendly and I can then recruit them on the cheap. But things in my life really work out that well. Yeah, this is, this has got insane. Oh my god. I didn't bring enough mollies. I then hear the moan of a survivor turning and this three-person enclave has become two. But I simply can't allow that to happen to Eugene, especially as the fate of the world lies on his shoulders. But this is The Walking Dead and nobody gets a happy ending. Unless you're Glenn and you just met a cute farm girl. Oh yeah, the car doctors, Abraham's group. You didn't even get a chance to meet Eugene. Eugene's now dead. To hopefully prevent the other enclave from completely collapsing, I decided it would be best to get as far away as humanly possible. But after all that fighting, Rick is very much in need of a little nap. Right now, my only aim is to get to the garage in town so I can collect a toolkit and get my pyro hawk up and running. And ideally I want to do that without causing as much chaos as I just did. Especially as the enclave nearby is basically my survivor pool. So it looks like we're going back to creeping about, which I'm sure is great for Rick's knees. I managed to creep on through without alerting the horde wandering past and can finally find myself a toolkit in the auto shop. And while I'm there I also collect some other shite and sell the stuff I'm not going to use to Andrea of the survivors across the road. Now I just need to take a gentle jog back to my car and obviously avoid the hundreds of zombies between me and it. Especially when my route takes me through this narrow valley which is blocked off at the far end by a massive horde. Oh my god! How am I supposed to get past them? And I can't retreat because I've riled up all the zombies behind me. Realistically, I've only got one option. Become a little bitch and climb on the top of this pickup. And after the horde starts to surround me, I see my opening and I've got to take it. But I'm really going to have to outrun this horde as my car is just over 200 metres away. And I'm certainly not going to be able to repair it with a bunch of flesh eating knobs beds trying to tear up my rectum. Thankfully it does seem the walkers in this mod have ADHD and get distracted very easily. Thanks to that Rick's able to clear out the few surrounding the car, then he can repair and refuel it. And being the only sheriff in town, Rick has another squabble he's gotta settle. My god this man is overworked, just look at that fatigue meter. I definitely need to work on getting this man a goddamn deputy. So I rock up to the site of the squabble, and this time I wanna speedrun things as fast as possible, as I don't wanna be referred to as the sheriff that gets everyone eaten. Show me your fucking hands. Ooh, alright, but don't be a fucking twat, is it? Just because I led a horde to your base like 20 minutes ago, and two of your friends got disemboweled while I stood around watching, leaving you behind as a solo survivor struggling with the will to survive almost certainly sending you into a downward spiral of drink and substance abuse doesn't mean you can swear at me. C Anyway, I obviously make sure to side with Rosita because, well, obviously. Oh yeah, what a great fucking sheriff we got here. Yeah, fucking right. Now run along. I then hear Rosita get into a bit of trouble with a zombie and obviously I rush to save her. Okay, yeah, I have just alerted every zombie in the area. Right, let's just drive away rather quickly. I mean, come on, chat. Why? I, I didn't even need to read it. I'm obviously just going to side with Rosita. What more can a man do? You know what I mean? Now I just need another 200 influence before I can recruit someone. So I head back to base to see what the previous community left in the supply locker. But I'm starting to suspect the loneliness is getting 
get into the ref. Back. Don't make a big deal out of it. I think Rick's losing his mind, man. He just, you know, he's on his own. He's like, I'm back. I take another coffee to help relieve the fatigue, then collect an assortment of books and rucksacks to sell to my neighbours. I also grabbed a sanitizing machine and two redundant ARs. S insane amount of zombies that is, by the way. Right next to my base. I then head to this petrol station to meet up with a wandering trader. I then sell her all of my shite, and with almost 2,000 influence, I make my way to recruit our first community member. And seeing as the game won't let me recruit my son yet, I need another alpha male to help build the community they'd be proud of. So Abraham, welcome to the Rictatorship. Also, thanks to the community editor, I'm able to recruit him without it disbanding the entire enclave. Don't worry, Rosita, we'll be back for you later. And right now, I should probably head back to base, take over as Abraham to give Rick a rest. But to be fair, the coffee is doing a pretty decent job of holding back my fatigue. So instead, I agree to take on some more sheriff duties. It's quite important not to lead a massive horde right up to your allies' gates. Because if you do, they tend to get a bit cross about it. So I chat to Sandy from the colony of survivors, and she's like, our mate was murdered and Caesar disappeared right after. But if I'm being honest, that evidence sounds circumstantial at best. But then again, I'm probably not going to be able to get the CSI team out here anytime soon. So I agreed to see if I can go and find Caesar. Well, he's not in this open air shed right next to the my family, but I do find him hiding out at this empty storefront. So I confront him and he's like, whoa, Sheriff, calm down. Put away that red-handled machete. I promise I didn't kill anyone. I'll help you track down this evidence. What are you looking for? Before all this happened, I stashed the gun they say I used. If we find that gun, it'll be obvious it wasn't a murder weapon. Oh, I don't know about that, but it sounds like you're clutching at straws to me. But I agree to check out this lead. Oh, you put it there. You had to put it there, didn't you? Right next to 60 fucking zombies. Oh my god, you're gonna win a Darwin Award, you mate. So I come up with, frankly, a genius plan. Firstly, I overshoot our destination and whack on the fireworks. And lead the two wandering hordes away from our destination. But again, it seems the walkers have ADHD. So I revert to my backup plan of putting my arse to good use. And surprisingly, this actually goes pretty well. In fact, I take out all 60 walkers without even causing damage to my car. And after that, I can search the military checkpoint and find the gun that Caesar stashed. I'll be honest, I don't know how this proves his innocence, but I put all of my faith in Rick Grimes. So I take him back to the colony of survivors, and I'm like, yo, guess what? Caesar's innocent. But if you weren't the killer, that means... Oh, shit. Yes, it means the killer is still at large. Oh, hang on, the red diamond means shoot on sight. It only takes like five headshots, but I do take down the true killer. I do shit like that. Am I any better than the Zeds? Rick, I mean, now's not the time for a bloody, like, midlife crisis, all right? They are proper happy and promise to help me fight the blood plague. Meanwhile, I loot the corpse of their dead former friend and sell them their shite right back to him. And after that, I can finally head home to give Rick a well-deserved rest. Let's go, Abraham, you badass motherfucker. And Abraham's job is simple. Earn enough influence so we can recruit Rosita to the team. And starting off, he decides to make amends with Ethan from the villagers. And thankfully, he's only after one thing. Rotten walker flesh. So I give Ethan some decaying limbs or something, and that's all it takes for him to become my friend again. If only it was that easy to make friends in real life. I then abuse our newfound friendship to get a better price on the facility mods I'm never gonna use. Hey, don't blame me, blame society. I then take Abraham into town to do a good chunk of looting. And my plan is a simple one. I once again make the area safe with my rear end, then start searching the high street for valuable items. I make sure to keep every rucksack I find and store it in the back of the pickup. But everything else I find I sell to the, the survivors in the corner office. And during that process, we discover exactly how much of a badass that Abraham is. I've no idea how I did that. But while I'm bashing skulls, I get locked in an animation as a walker starts to lunge. No, 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 no. Thankfully, Abraham is one speedy boy. He's certainly not going to be taken out by some sneaky motherfucker. We spend the rest of the night going through every single shop and abuse our newfound strength to smash in all the skulls we can. Right up to the point where I fill up the pickup and drain the, the survivors of all of their influence. And just like that, we're only a hundred influence away from reuniting Abraham and Rosita. I can then get back to base just as the sun starts to rise and I can unload our spoils of war. However, we do have two dangerous hordes moving towards our base. What I don't want is that horde to join that horde, and then we have an even bigger problem. So I pull off what's without a doubt the greatest molly throw in gaming history. That might help. The fire spreads amongst the horde, causing all 30 heads to pop in rhythm. Oh my god, that was insane. That was an amazing molly throw. That was the best molly throw I've ever done in my life. And now I just need to repeat it for this second wandering horde. Chat, that's gotta be worth... Okay, here they come. Here they come. How the fuck did they notice me then? Alright, yes, taking down this horde was nowhere near as clean. But two molly throws do the majority of the heavy lifting. Then for the stragglers, I take them down thanks to my over-the-shoulder 
the wrestling moves. Oh, look at that chat. We just took down 60 zombies in about two and a half minutes. I think that was pretty decent. Then Abraham decides to go looking for some building materials so we can upgrade our existing facilities. But first, he's got to take down another horde that was attracted by the sound of my engine. But unfortunately, I don't find any building materials in this unfinished house. But what I do find is a boom box, some gin, and a suspicious amount of painkillers. I guess the builders who used to work here were proper sesh heads. I then check out another construction site nearby, but unfortunately only find a big old shovel. I've been very unlucky with my loot here. So in my desperation for building materials, I turn to this garage nearby. There's another 30 horde down there! And unfortunately, the garage door is locked. So once I smash through it, I'll have to search quickly before the horde below can catch up to me. Oh no no no! 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 Abraham! I guess we're gonna need RIPs for Abraham in the comment section. Oh, for fuck's sake. But that, unfortunately, is the brutality of this mod. I bash in a door, and the next thing you know, I'm being munched on. RIP Abraham, you might have only lasted 30 minutes, but you were an absolute beast. So I once again spawn back in as our solo survivor, Rick Grimes. Rick's not even fully healed. I can't believe that. That is shocking. Rick now needs to go and collect all of the goodies that Abraham left behind. Oh, yeah, and there's another massive horde right next to my base. Rick enters the garage, and it seems all of the zombies have wandered off other than Abraham's reanimated corpse. And he immediately takes half my health from a wild swing. Have some of that, you prick. I collect as much shite as I can carry, then go collect the car. And there's another massive pissing hole just the other side of it. Well, you can probably figure out exactly how I'm gonna handle this. At the end of the day, there's a reason the comment section call me the God of Fire. Sweet dreams, you burning bastards. Well, there's a reason they call me the Molotov God. And I think I've just proved that. I then collect the rest of Abraham's shite, only leaving behind the knife and backpack, but still don't find any bloody building materials. Damn, it's so sad to see that Abraham died for a lost cause. So now, Rick is once again on his own. However, Abraham done his job exceptionally well, and we are already incredibly close to being able to afford another member of the team. And that's when a mission finally comes in clutch for us. You see, Rosita is starving and asking if we have any spare food. And weirdly, the one thing we have in abundance is food. But most importantly, completing another mission for her should make her friendly and that'll half her recruitment costs. I'm playing tactics. Fucking tactics. Oh yeah, I see you, Talbot. Feeding the hot Hispanic lady. Oh yeah, I see you all your bloody tactics, boyo. But what if she asks about the disappearance of Abraham? Abraham? No, I didn't recruit him. He, 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 I thought he was with you. Do you know what I mean? No, Abraham. No, I don't know an Abraham. I make sure to clear out the immediate area to make it as safe as possible. I can then give her the rucksack of pizza. I gain a hundred influence for my trouble, but most importantly, the enclave now becomes friendly. And thankfully, recruiting her has become half the price. Rosita Espinosa, welcome to the Rictatorship. She agrees to join, but instead of waiting for me to loot her former home, she decides to take the scenic route and walk back. But while I'm looting, I suddenly hear a commotion coming from outside. Oh, no, 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 no! Rosita! You bastard! I guess I didn't make the area as safe as I thought I had. R.I.P. Rosita. You have literally no highlight reel, but I'm sure you would have been good at some point. I put her down the way she'd want. Molotov until her head explodes. At that point, I thought I was gonna settle down with Rosita. Screw the fucking kid. And that's when I realised my mistake. I have no option to search her corpse because she had nothing on her. That was the reason Sasha got bit so easy. Even Abraham had literally nothing when I recruited him. It's all my fault. And Rick is once again alone. But not just alone. Alone and fucking poor. What a waste of 750 influence. Oh yeah, I've still got a horde right back at base too. Right, Rick, get your ass ready, mate. For Christ's sake, don't take that out of context. I just mean I'm reversing over the walkers, all right? Nothing more, nothing less. Right, so once again, I'm desperate for influence. So I again grab a load of shite I'm not gonna use from my supply locker, and this time make my way to a specialist wandering trader. Which is fantastic news, because Myra over here has two and a half thousand influence for me to steal. I can get my influence as high as 1300, thanks to all the shit I brought with me. And after fully searching the Tartan Mart, she's hiding in, as well as the storage shed next door, I can get myself the 1500 influence I need to recruit someone else. So after that, the toughest decision I have is who do I recruit next? Originally, I wanted Daryl to be my first community member, but him and his brother have pissed off and are nowhere to be found. So I recruited the badass soldier and his crew, and, well, we know exactly how that ended. But maybe I should have been sticking with the original survivors from the very beginning. So please welcome Glenn to the Rectatorship. But this time I've learnt my lesson and enlist him as a follower before he wanders off into a horde. Not not the smart play, Glenn, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I wouldn't advise jumping in the back, that's all I'm saying, but... Alright, you know what, I'm not gonna judge. So I take Glenn safely back to base, and swap to him in order to give Rick a rest. And when I'm sorting out his loadout, I realise I've only got a 7 slot backpack and no close combat weapon. But that's okay, because I left both a knife and an 8 slot backpack on Abraham's corpse. So I make that my first port of call, but things aren't always that simple. Oh my god, I, apparently Abraham isn't dead, because he's locked the door behind him. I take both his knife and backpack, but Glenn gets very emotional. We haven't forgotten you. Mate, you weren't even around. Mate, you never met him. In a, another universe you might have. All the doors are locked in this mall, I swear to god.
Oh no 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 no! Shit! Are you kidding me? Yeah, so that's completely my bad. I was used to Rick's frontward execution, and well, yeah, Glenn didn't have that power. Rest in peace, Glenn. I can't believe I've just speed ran killing off one of the most important characters in the Walking Dead universe. So Rick once again has to hunt down another one of his friend's bodies. Although I use the word friend there very loosely, as he's barely known any of these people. He collects all of his stuff, and once again make my way back to that wandering trader with my pockets full of my most valuable loot. And rather controversially, I choose to sell my only 50 cal. So have a smidge over 800 influence, so I'm just over halfway to get in my next character. And thankfully, there's a player cut literally just around the corner. And what makes it even better is this one I know how to cheat. By parking it like so, I block the entrance for zombies to get to me. Although there is a few I've got to take out on the inside. That's when I come up with stage two of my brilliant plan. Drop in everything to make myself as light as possible, including my hatchet. That leaves me with nothing more than my close combat weapon to take on the player cut. But why, you moron, I hear you scream. When I save all the durability for my hatchet, and two are nice and light which saves me stamina which I'm pretty sure we can all agree I desperately need. It takes a good few minutes but we eventually take the hat down with nothing more than our combat knife, but I only gain a measly 75 influence for my troubles. But that's alright I was only after its loot. Then I can make my way back to the wandering trader, and by selling them all of my loot I gain an additional 400 influence. And now I got 1200 influence. Then I head back to the little town where the, the survivors are hanging out, because I plan on looting the rest of the buildings that Abraham missed out on previously. However, I get into a bit of a fight, and as usual, that seriously escalates. I think all my mollies are in the boot. That's a bad move on my part. So I go on a little jog to try and lose their interest, and then manage to creep back around into the police station. Just gotta search very slowly, considering we're surrounded by about 400,000 zombies. Zombie? What the fuck's a zombie, boy? -o? You mean them goddamn walkers? I search for the rest of the police station, then make it an outpost. Which you might think's a stupid idea, as I need influence to recruit more people. And you'd have a point, to be fair. But with a base this close to the, the survivors, it should make sense in all of my redundant shit so much easier. But before I can fully search the police station, zombies start entering. And pretty quickly, one becomes two and two becomes too many. So I lob a flashbang out the back window and leg it out to the front. But my mini-map is lit up like a giant fucking Christmas tree. I'd say the best thing I can do right now is just retreat. But Ethan the little freak has decided he wants more play examples. Okay, cool. Well, I know exactly where to get some. This rotten play cart husk. God knows what this man is doing with all that rotten zombie flesh. But hey, look, I'm not here to judge a man. Here you go, but you have your flesh and I'll take my influence. In fact, actually, seeing as we're now BFFs, why don't you give me a really good price on all the shit I don't use? And that puts me back in range to recruit a new buddy. And this time it's Michonne we add to the dictatorship. I again give her a lift back to my base, with her sat in the back enjoying the open air. But the decide now is not a time to risk another life, as Rick has a side project he needs to complete. You see, the real reason Michonne joined is because Rick promised to solve a problem. You see a group of survivors calling themselves the The Saviors are held up in the container a fort on the other side of Cascade Hills, and they've been forcing all the local enclaves to give them half of their shit. And as the sheriff, it's Rick's duty to put an end to these bastards. But their their saviors are 30 strong, and hostiles on lethal zone are not to be messed with. So I come up with a very special plan, using the firework car to make as much noise as humanly possible, then charging into the belly of the beast, dropping a boombox. I activate the boombox, and all the Negan start chasing me. But like Sasha, Abraham, and Rosita before them, none of these bastards have any weapons. So there is absolutely fuck all they can do to stop me. Hordes and hordes of walkers rip through their home. A few of them try starting a fight with me, but with literally no weapons equipped, they can't lay a finger on me. If I get them all into a, into a little circle, what I'll do is I'll drop a frag. And to be fair, I've got pretty good of herding walkers. And it turns out it's not much difference between herding the undead and herding the living. Okay, one of them's died. We got 29 left. Oh, look, this one's taking a nap. And say what you want about Negan, but the fuckers are incredibly difficult to kill. But with enough ammo, anything is possible. You can take it, that's for sure. The place turns into a literal war zone as I make as much noise as possible, and the more noise I make, the more walkers that'll come to fight on my side. And just when you think you can't get any more walkers, I head outside, set off a couple of shots to attract more in. And once again, Negan can take a serious fucking hit. I take refuge on a shipping container out the front, and just sit back watching the chaos unfold. Uh, look, I'm, I'm gaining influence, so I'm pretty sure that means more hostiles are dying. One after one, every single saviour will fall. Look, all the zombies are Negans! I head back inside, and we only have 11 further saviours remaining. I find a dead Negan on the shipping container, 
And seeing as he has a search icon, decide to check out what's in his pocket. Who'd have guessed Negan was a massive pillhead? All the Negans have got healables for some reason, but nobody else has had anything. That's so interesting. I don't know why these Negans have, have no longer, they've just given up, I guess. But this is the dictatorship. There is no surrender. And with one Negan left, with the sun starting to rise, I drop my final molly and watch the flames consume the undead. But as we've discovered, Negans are an absolute beast. So it's Rick's machine gun that takes the final kill. And that is the end of their, their saviors. Rest in pieces, you leather-wearing sons of bitches. Rest in many pieces. And at that point, it's time to head back home and take over as Michonne. A katana-wielding badass that also has nightmares. And Michonne's first job is a simple one. Loot the entire area so we don't starve horribly. Michonne can use her impressive ninja-like skills to carve up a miniature horde. And you might be able to tell I'm playing like someone who lost two very important characters previously. She then breaks into Leafy Acre's garden supply shop, but that loud entrance has just attracted walkers. But if I'm being honest, the walkers are the least of my concerns. Curveballs of a walker, that could really be an issue. Curveballs have the potential to make this dangerous mod even more dangerous. -er. That's a real word, I'm adding it to the dictionary, alright? As you may have noticed, my main way of taking out the walkers is with the swordplay takedown animation. That's gonna be a lot harder to do if they explode into a gunky mess on impact. No, 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 no! Oh my god. See, now you might think I'm panicking there. Um, you most definitely are, mate. But trust me, they will get you. Watch your back up there. Zombies explode with gunk have sprung up everywhere. Well, that has kind of ruined my plan. So Michonne carries on her looting, but as of yet, we haven't found anything of much use. In fact, by the time she's finished searching this entire area, we haven't found a single rucksack. But strangely, I have found an abundance of high-value alcohol. Well, I'm sure that'll come in handy later when I'm trying to bribe more community members. So I head back to base to unload my fun juice. But unfortunately, my gas-guzzling pickup creates too much noise. I also make a stupid mistake. No, 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 no! Oh my god. I have no idea how Michonne avoided the bite there. Maybe it was divine intervention. Maybe Michonne is the chosen one. Chosen to lead this group through adversity. Or maybe it's just because sword play attacks can't be interrupted by a zombie assault. I guess we'll never know. Should have grabbed the mollies. How the fuck did I, of all people, not bring mollies. Also, that's the best shooting I've ever done in my life. I managed to lose the rest of the horde, thanks to a new tactic I've been working on. It's called run away like you're a scaredy little bitch. I then head back to base to collect all the valuable alcohol and travel to the enclave that's known as the My Family. I suppose that makes the whole going back to base thing kind of redundant, but let's just try to forget about that, shall we? But unfortunately I'm not able to trade with them, as they're looking for my help instead. But Sean agrees to help them find a rucksack of ammo, so to find some she goes to the local gun shop. Makes sense, right? Except all I find is crossbow bolts and parts. Oh, for Christ's sake, why is there any parts in here? This is the worst gunshot I've ever been to in my life. Oh, but you're Welsh as fuck. You've never been in a gun shop in your entire bloody life. With no obvious locations nearby, I'm forced to do something I really didn't want in order to obtain that ammo rucksack. Going back to my base and pulling it out of my storage locker. Oh, I need to, Oh my god, I can't even get it out. <sighs> so it looks like we're back to the drawing board. Then I remember I can use the radio to locate some ammo. Well, thank god for that. That's so much easier. So Michonne heads to the small little office, but unfortunately finds absolutely jack shit. All right, well, it's obviously not going to be the ammo shop I've already searched in, right? Wrong! Turns out Michonne is blind as a bloody bat. So Michonne drifts back to the My Family and gives Laurie the sack of ammo. And thankfully that turns the enclave from neutral to friendly. I can then use our newfound friendship to negotiate a better trade price on all my high value alcohol. I've also bought a repair kit off him so I can fix up the utility truck. I'm sure that won't be a massive waste of influence. Michonne then goes back to loot in the local area, but not before dealing with another horde with some more rear end shenanigans. But I'm starting to suspect her nightmares aren't the only demons in her closet. Oh, or a bottle of absinthe, that's what we like to see. That's what we like to get in our nail salon. Obviously, it must be a really stressful job. She really seems to have a nose for high value alcohol. Then, in the car park outside, we get attacked by the gunky Zeds, and Michonne deals with them in a way that would terrify the Tory government. Then, Michonne accepts a radio call from a local alcoholic that's become stranded and has asked for our assistance. Although, I'd say our timing definitely could have been better. Oh, oh god. Well, you know what? Now we have no reason to be here. To finish off that one. No, we don't need to finish anyone off, love. Alright, that's very rude for a start. Still look Looking for rucksacks of resources, Michonne enters Lowell. Although it's not long until she gets pretty tired. And that stamina tanks faster than Spurs' title charge when a nearby horde hears my loud searching. I think it might be time to get out of here. Thankfully, even though she's knackered, Michonne is one agile lass. And always remember, when in doubt, make sure you're carrying pipe bombs. Thankfully, she's able to make her escape in the utility truck. Although it is once again smoking. But thankfully, Michonne can drift back to base with no further issues. And swap to our sheriff, Rick Grimes. And Rick's first mission is 
to deal with our second curveball of the video, the Lone Raider. And that sneaky bastard is stealing our daily supplies, like. And we're poor enough as it is. Get fucked, mate. Go steal off some other knobhead who can afford it, like. The Raider has set himself up deep in plague territory. And unfortunately, it seems we don't have the fuel to make the trip. So I pull into the local petrol station to refuel. But my smoky engine has gone from a shade that would get me through British customs to a shade that would get me sent off to Rwanda. I'm obviously able to refuel, but now I need a repair kit. So I decide to check out the shop attached to the forecourt. Although I'll be honest, I'm not even sure if it's possible to find one in here. But hey, at least I managed to find myself a machete and a shitty pack of playing cards. Well, I'm pretty sure neither of them are going to be any good for repairing a dodgy engine. So I head north where I spot a car on the map. It's rare, but you can occasionally get toolkits in the back of cars. Unfortunately, here all I get is liquidized dinosaur and painkillers that won't even give me any kind of buzzy side effects. I want to try searching for one in this garage, but unfortunately it's locked and my map is lit up like a giant fucking Christmas tree. So you know what? I think it's just time to get the bloody hell out of here. Ignoring the needs of my car, I head on forward. That is until a sizable horde spawns in front of me. And it's fair to say I'm not working my way around that thing. Well, it's a bloody good thing Rick Grimes is the walking definition of a power bottom. As long as nothing touches... Oh, for Christ's sake. Well, who's seen that one coming in? Rick gets some safety between him and the horde and jumps out. Go, Rick, go, go, go. And now Rick Grimes is on his own. In plague territory and in the middle of the night with no car. He's gonna need himself a bloody big miracle to make it out of this alive. The first thing he does is run to the local power station for the very slim chance of finding himself a toolkit which will allow him to fix up his car. But unfortunately, no. All he finds is scraps of circuitry. And to be fair, a bloody good amount of circuitry. If I wasn't fighting for my life, I'd be absolutely chuffed about it. This shit is very rare and very useful. Just not in my current predicament. The Lone Raider is just across the road and he has two potential toolkit locations in his garden. It's time to get to murdering. But from a legal point of view, this is like third degree murder at best. As I don't directly cause harm to the individual, I just love firecrackers through the bloke's window. Grenade! No, dickhead, I just said it was bloody firecrackers for fuck's sake. You really need to start listening. Now, we just sort of wait and pray. Pray and loot for goodies, may I add? Alright, well that's not a good start. I find another machete, more circuitry scraps, but most importantly, no toolkits. The firecrackers have also stopped, uh, well, cracking, I guess? And the Lone Raider is defending his back door from walkers. So I try creeping around the front to surprise him with a cheeky headshot, but the walkers deal with him before I can even whip it out. There we go. Well, that's him dealt with. Lone Raider, kill the hostile. The hostile is now dead. But I do still need a plan for getting my car up and running. Thankfully, there's a guaranteed spawn in a garage nearby, but there is literally hordes of walkers between me and it. So I decide to waste a pipe bomb to hopefully gather them all in one location. I also climb the nearby cell tower because, well, game on anxiety, I guess. I don't know why, but if I don't scout out those specific three locations I haven't yet, I'll get a very uneasy feeling. And with two hearts awake, we have a pretty serious infestation problem building. Ah, fuck it, that's the next dickhead's problem. I need the toolkit then to get out of here. But to get there, I'm gonna have to use all of my sneak skills. The pipe bomb did fuck all to distract the hordes. And there is frankly a gigantic horde just outside the area of the auto shop. So what I need right now is utter stealth. Absolutely no dicking about, I need to be as quiet as a fart in an elevator. But for some reason, I just decide to lob another pipe bomb. Pretty successfully, may I add. It does seem to have worked at least. It's attracted zombies, it's attracting zombies there, but they're staying away from me. I might just be a genius, you know. Alright, dickhead, calm the fuck down, is it? Just because you can lob a pipe bomb doesn't mean you're prime Josie Mourinho. I enter the garage, but there's still a couple of knobheads hanging about. Well, it's a bloody good thing Rick is an absolute machine with his axe. Thankfully, I find the toolkit with no more issues, but just by glancing at my map, I can see there's a horde surrounding my car. And that's assuming I can even make the nearly 500 meter run. There are many hordes and many infestations between me and my car. This is going to be Rick Grimes' toughest challenge yet. Nah, probably not. I'm just trying to build up tension. But I do take the opportunity to have a gentle sprint through a level 3 infestation. And for no real reason, I'm just that kind of knobhead. I then get to the car and realise the monumental task ahead of me. There are too many to kill silently and they are too close to my car to even think about starting the repair. I have also used up the last of my pipe bombs so can't manoeuvre the horde with noise. I guess we kind of wait for them to wander past. Do you reckon that's feasible? It's only 19 here, reckons. They're not wandering past over there. They're just sort of wandering around. And I've still got a stim active, although it is my last. Would it be smart to make a move now while it's still possible for me to outrun them? So many conflicting ideas are going through my head right now. But in the end, I spend so much time procrastinating the problem, they just wander past with no issues. This is mental. I've never been this successful at stealth in my life. But who'd have guessed that's some life advice for you? Procrastination solves all of your problems. And with the engine fixed, I can get in and drive away. Although I'm definitely facing the wrong direction, so I've got to do a cheeky U-turn at the next available point. But then I've got to drive back through the horde I was trying to avoid. Oh no, 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 no. 
Okay, that's fine. We got through it. We got through it. Barely, but we got through it. I'm gonna pop by the survivors enclave and see if they've got a toolkit for sale. I think I have literally been buying every single toolkit I can. I do pop in to see my friends at the the survivors, but unfortunately they don't have any toolkits. But I'll definitely be helping myself to some building materials. I then get word over the radio that our friends the villagers have added a few new members to their community and have invited Rick over to say hello. There's this fella named D, also known as Dwight Ever. And it's funny as this game doesn't have a burned face NPC so the mod creator just made him an old man. I guess I enter the face and a poor skin routine is the same thing in the apocalypse. I also take this opportunity to buy myself a toolkit. I can then repair the truck and meet the other newbies. Introducing this masked little fella named Alpha. Hi. Oh, I'm very sorry, that was extremely sexist of me. I just assumed any five foot tall person that called themselves Alpha would be some Andrew Tate loving virgin. So before things get awkward, I head back to Dwight and ask him if he wants to join the rectatorship. And thankfully he does, so I agree to give him a lift back to his new home. Yeah, just allow the wind to flow through your locks, but it's alright. So we get back to base with no issues, but now Rick needs to tag someone else in as he's getting a little bit sleepy. The bloke has done a solid 45 minutes of work and has decided he now needs a nap. I'm gonna take a guess and say Rick Grimes is my spirit animal. I suppose it would only be right to test out our newbie Dwight, but first I think I should check out his traits. He's a former delivery driver, a little sadistic, and a firearms enthusiast. Basically, this man is a walking red flag. I then give him a heavy weapon, arm him with a shotty, and give him enough opioids to run a crack den. I actually intend Ended on sending him out to knock out some player cards. That is until I realise we have an allied enclave in need of food. And I'm trying to keep everyone happy and seeing as we have an abundance of food, decide to go and help them out. So Dwight heads over there to meet their acquaintance, and it seems these two have also added newbies to their ranks. But first I gotta fend off against a couple of knobheads which my engine has attracted. Someone's got a crossbow. I wonder who could have a crossbow. I start by giving Sandy the sack of food, then purchase two toolkits from them. I then introduce myself to this mysterious archer. Que pasa, ese? I have no idea why Daryl Dixon is suddenly mixed. Mexican? But at the end of the day, this is supposed to be an alternative timeline of The Walking Dead. Anyway, using precisely zero influence, I welcome Daryl to the rectatorship. Which is a bit wild, because his brother Merle is like, nah mate, I ain't fucking joining you. We head outside and I check Daryl's inventory. Oh my god, he's got the he's got the repeating crossbow. And a wedding ring, for some reason. Which is extremely heavy, look at that. I decide to swap the Daryl to get a better look. And it turns out the bloke is absolutely loaded. Imagine carrying 33 grand's worth of wedding rings on you. It gets quite dark when you think that Daryl Dixon isn't even married. So he's either been collecting them off walkers, or he's murdered nearly a thousand married people. Answers in the comment section. Where do you think Daryl got all these wedding rings from? We once again head back to base, and we find out exactly how many wedding rings Daryl had on him. 900 and bloody 90. Casual 999 simple wedding rings. Nice one, Daryl. You fucking psychopath. Immediately abandoning Dwight like an old toy, we take off as everyone's favourite archer, Daryl Dixon. And apparently a mysterious stranger fancies a chat. He's gonna die before he gets here, man. So Daryl decides to go and meet him in the field. Oh my god, he is taking on a horde on his own. Very successfully, may I add. The problem is he wants to hunt bloaters. And there's no freaks in this mod, so um, that's going to be quite difficult. But hey, let's not worry about that, is it? We've basically got a free piece of cannon fodder for now. I do pop by the bloater location just to see, but this tavern has a lower population than a COVID ravaged nursing home. But at least I managed to find ourselves a sack of food, so this wasn't a complete waste of time. I was also able to use my new BFF to sell him a load of redundant shite. But unfortunately we had to put Daryl's adventure to an end prematurely. I get back to base and take over as Rick, because Rick has an urgent mission he needs to attend with. Shane from the My Family has a missing friend, and that friend is either Rick's son Carl or Rick's wife Lori. I swear to God though, if I help Shane and I come back and both my wife and kid are dead because like all the hordes around you. It might be the start of my villain arc. Rick enters the shed and sees Shane and Carl standing there alone. Laurie hasn't checked in lately. Can you go and ch What? Yes! Yes, I go- I- I guess I will go find my wife. What the hell is wrong with you? Rick jumps into his pickup and takes off. And luckily, Laurie's last known location isn't far away. Laurie, I'm coming. He's not enough of a man for you. All right, but let's keep things PG, is it? I'll save you, Laurie. But as Rick arrives, a horde was also wandering by. And in order to save his wife, he's got to sacrifice his rear end. I'm sure any good husband would do the bloody same, with the majority of the horde thin this time to get out of the pickup. Laurie, stay with me. Then I just whip out the machine gun and go to town on the Romanas. And with everything around us dead for a second time, I can go talk to my wife. I'm glad you're here, I hurt my ankle, I don't think I get myself home. Follow me, I'll get you home. So I then give Laurie a lift back home. She enjoys the fresh, smoky air in the back of the pickup, and our bloater hunter friend has decided to go his own way. You know what, that might be the first piece of cannon fodder to ever survive me. Fair play to him. Rick gets her safely home, but unfortunately it's still not enough. The enclave has gone from friendly to allied. I should be able to recruit any member for free, but the option is simply not there. And I have exactly the same problem with my son Carl. I can recruit Shane. Really? I don't want to recruit Shane, I want to recruit my wife and child. 
child. Lori, just know I always loved you and I will be back for you. And you, Carl. I know you don't, might not love me at the moment, but it's okay. I will earn your love and respect. I will build a community that you will be proud of. I'll see you soon, son. I'll see you soon, wife. In his desperation to prove he's a better man than Shane, Rick has to do something he's not proud of. But first he pays a visit to a group of alcoholics. They apparently want to join the Rick Tatorship, which is proper surprising with what happened earlier. Rick kills a bunch of walkers, which he did technically attract to their home, then tells them there's not a chance in hell they're joining the Rick Tatorship. How about you get fucked? Anyway, back to the evil shit he definitely doesn't want to do. You see, we need two additional people before we can move to a better home, and there's two people we can recruit for free immediately. Alpha and Beta. They both agree to join the Rictatorship. I suppose this is what happens when you accidentally murder a bunch of iconic characters in episode 1. You end up recruiting a bunch of nut job antagonists. But now with 6 people I can set our sights on a new home. Rick makes his way to more and more distributing. And after gently asking the current residents if they wouldn't mind finding a new place to live, Rick claims it as a home. But the one thing I've realised is things are very really that simple in this mod. For love of god, can everybody stay inside please? This is a very dangerous mod for you all to be stood here. Apparently Rick does doesn't have that much influence over these guys because they just remain outside. Well, whatever, it's a free country. So now it's time to start building our new home. And I'm not saying I'm one jammy little fucker, but I do get a well-oiled machine curveball spawn just as I'm about to start building. To get started, I build and upgrade the infirmary, build a big old garden outside, then upgrade my command center to level 2 so I can build more outposts. Then while everything is building, I take over as Daryl and head off to do some looting. Starting with this warehouse area on the northern side of the map. And thankfully Daryl is one fast and nimble lad, as he's able to search all three containers in this vehicle bay before the horde catches up with him. But now he's in a bit of trouble as he doesn't have swordplay like Michonne or Rick. He also doesn't have gunslinger which I thought was surprising. Have you ever seen Daryl miss a crossbow bolt? No, it's not happening. Anyway, I decide to hide behind this rock and hope the horde just wanders past. Which surprisingly works quite well, although there is still quite a few walkers around this location. And when I enter the warehouse, everybody immediately notices me. This must be what it's like to be Instagram famous. Unfortunately, the crowds get too much and I've got to escape through the back door. I try fighting off the pursuers in the bushes, but there really is too many of them and I'm forced to retreat. I take refuge in the power station, seeing as there's only one way in and out. I then step back and line them all up one by one, taking them all down with my repeating crossbow. I do eventually have to get my axe dirty, but overall that horde has been dealt with. Next, 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 line them up, line them up. That was going through you, like a hot knife through butter. But just when I think I've taken out the last of the zombies and I can start looting, the game's like, nah, 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 don't think so, bitch. Oh my god, yes there is. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So unfortunately, I've got to retreat pretty sharpish. I head to a house nearby seen as there's a good few sheds to loot around here, and I'm always in desperate need of building materials. And thankfully my command center has now been upgraded to level 2, giving me an additional outpost. And I decide to use it as a temporary base of operations by here, but mainly just so I can drop off all the shit I've looted. Although unfortunately I don't find any building mats in the shed next door. In fact, even the hunting shack out the back was lackluster at best. Oh well, I suppose that's the joys of looting on lethal zone. So I head back to base and continue building. I start building a second farm, a ring collector, and a fighting gym. Then we get the hyper order mutation curveball spawn, and my base is smack dab in the bloody middle of it. Not great, especially when I've just started several building projects. So to get away from base, I decide to take on a play cart on the opposite side of the map. Typically just as a massive horde decides it wants to come wandering through. I use the horn on the pickup to keep them away from base. The last thing we need are the NPCs getting bitten. And overall, I'd say that was a pretty decent success. The sun has started to set when I get to the location of our first play cart. But thankfully, this is one you can block off with an intelligent parking maneuver. And what makes things better? the majority of the containers to search are in this little blocked off area, which means I can fill up the pickup and take down the play cart without even getting touched. Finally, some building materials. A stranger is also in the need of my help right next door, and this is one of those occasions where shit escalates extremely quickly. I will save you yet! But the question is, can Dwight save yet? I'm armed with a shotgun and pipe bombs, but even if I didn't use them, yet is still happy just blasting away. But this is Dwight before he ever met the saviours. This Dwight refuses to leave a woman behind, and thanks to our excessive pipe bombs and shotgun and blasts. Dwight has created more amputees than a Saudi prince. But just as things seem like they're starting to slow down, more and more trouble just seems to arise. And rather predictably, we unfortunately have to say goodbye. To absolutely no one. Here you go yet, have some painkillers. She then asks if she can join the gang, but as far as I'm aware, she's never been in an episode of The Walking Dead. See you later yet, I'm sure you'll be alright on your own. I then take a quick trip back to the Lowell police station to drop off a load of loot and rearm myself. I then decide to take on one more play cart before calling it a successful day. And the one I go with just happens to be in this warehouse, and I'm prepared for a shit ton of walkers. The first thing I do is drop a smoke grenade, however it unfortunately bounces back off a walker. But somehow this still distracted the walkers, and I was able to get the first phase of the play cart sorted without any issues. I then frag it and blast the hordes that have gathered since the smoke has dissipated, and that allows me to get 
the second phase off really quickly. And while its gases are dissipating, I drop a soda can bomb, but it seems like the walkers have figured out they can come through the window on the right side of the warehouse, as they now start to flood in in abundance. So I have a little run around and drop my second and last smoke grenade. But there seems to be a little bit too many, and with one bite kill, I decide it would be best to have a temporary retreat. I then head back in through the front entrance, and now under the cover of the smoke, I can get the play cart finished off. And now it's time to get the bloody hell out of Dodge. But my over-aggressive approach has brought in several sizable hordes, and they were all surrounding my car, so I've got to go on a little run to try and draw them away. That goes alright until a walker figures out how to climb up a car. Oh my god! Jesus! How did you get up on there, you prick? Down to half health on one swing. These walkers are the descendants of Mike Tyson. Thankfully, I take them on enough of a runabout, so by the time I get back to my car, I can escape safely. And Dwight can head back to base after a very successful mission. But there's one thing that slipped his mind. The hyper-auditory zombies. And he's just driven a giant fucking dinner bell right back to base. But Dwight is a selfless man. Remember, this is a man that never met Negan's iron. So he keeps blasting his shotgun to get all of their attention. He leads them all away on foot up into the mountains. Success Successfully saving all of his friends he's known for like, well, maybe a day or two at best. And remember folks, this is The Walking Dead, the show famous for literally never having a happy ending. The crowd get too big and now he's fully out of ammo, and in a moment of desperation he falls down a small incline. Dwight! Dwight! Please get up! No! Dwight! No! Dwight! 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 Get up you fucking nobbit! Why are you not getting up? Dwight! 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 For the love of- Dwight! Can I get an R.I.P. Dwight in the comment section? After that tragedy, we take over as Beta, and we have to fix up a radio tower. But for now, Beta just wants to get the hell out of the area. And he's also bringing his mate Alpha along for the ride. Because you see, simply put, these two despicable bastards are up to no good. But first, they've decided to sort out the radio tower that's causing the radio silence. You see, they've got to remain covert and blend in with their dictatorship. I really hope Alpha doesn't get immediately annihilated. Oh god! Well, I'm sure we can all agree that certainly could have gone better. She should have stuck on some bloody scent block. What a moron. Beta does what he does best and clears the area of the undead. But then I make the mistake of forgetting how the whole radio silence curveball works. There's no point climbing that tower, but you ain't gonna make the area safe that way. Can I not secure it because it's in blood plague territory? Oh, shit. So it looks like we're gonna be taking on a certain player card. But I do have scent block because, you know, obviously Alpha and Beta, they move amongst the zombies. That was the idea. And then Alpha just got immediately fucking annihilated. What a stupid woman. So Beta raids the corpse of his former ally, then after a quick repositioning of the car, Beta then covers himself in some walker guts. And now with Beta invisible to the walker's scent, I go in to batter some meat. Let's go, we're scent blocking it. The first phase goes off pretty quickly thanks to Beta's heavy weapon, and then I do what I do best by dropping back and setting everything on fire. That very successfully cleared the room of the undead. Not that I needed the room clear of course, because you know, scent block. The second phase always comes quicker, it's kind of like a virgin's first visit to a strip club. Although I try re-entering the cloud too early and well, yeah. Toxic fumes isn't exactly good for your health. So I once again set everything on fire, but I feel the walkers are starting to suspect there's a mole within their ranks. Seriously, like, these bastards are following me around like a lost puppy. I'm just grateful there's no actual puppies in this mod. Then rather surprisingly, disaster strikes. Oh my god, the car's gone! What have you done? Oh I ass away, but blame everyone else but yourself, is it? Aye, nothing to do with the mollies you dropped earlier, is it, bad? Just gotta add find a toolkit to the list of problems we now gotta solve. But hey, at least I can take down this play card. But what makes things worse is this cell tower is still in plague territory. Oh, for Christ's sake. How many am I going to have to kill? Well, that is an issue, isn't it? How clutch would it be, though, right now? Right, if I got a toolkit in this play card. Unfortunately, my luck doesn't work that way. Well, let's go see if uh, this lovely enclave by here has any uh, has any toolkits for sale. And for once, it seems my luck is starting to turn. <gasps> They've got a toolkit. They are geniuses. Thank you very much. I make sure to pay them back like any good neighbor would by using my shotgun during a massive fucking dinner bell. <laughs> I couldn't be beta, could I, without bloody attracting all the zombies? What the bloody hell is a zombie, but I'm pretty sure you mean a goddamn walker. Anyway, I fix up the car, then go check out to see how the enclave is handling the problem I caused them. And it turns out they're actually doing alright. Significantly better than Alpha did earlier, at least. All three of them are still knocking about strong, so I decide to test out their resilience with a fragmentation grenade. 
But unfortunately, it seems the walkers in this area are simply not bothered in the slightest. Well, it's time to bloody rectify that. Thankfully, there's a level 3 infestation nearby, and I intend to weaponize the absolute shit out of it. And thankfully, the scent block is starting to wear off. Otherwise, this plan would be utterly useless. I jump back out of the window to make a little bit of noise, and the walkers start getting attracted to my location. The scent block then wears off, which almost causes a feeding frenzy. Here we go. Oh, God. No, no, no. Jesus. Oh, my God. No idea what the bloody hell that jump was. But thankfully, we're still alive, so let's get out of here. Go on, this way, please. Infestation cleared. There we go. And we got 28 influence for that. Not only have I dragged a level 3 infestation with me, but I've also caught the attention of a nearby horde. You can probably figure out what we're going to do with this horde. I make a lot more noise than go and hide at the back of the remnants' shed. But regrettably, they seem to be doing a much better job of handling the situation in comparison to Alpha. I'd say Alpha wasn't as Alpha as she thirst fought. The three remnants head outside to deal with the problem I've caused, so I close the door to keep myself nice and safe inside. Peace and peace and quiet, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, no, no. All of that excessive screaming means the remnants have gone from three to two. All right, scratch that, make that one. And with there being two massive hordes outside those doors, it's not too long before, ironically, there's nothing left of the remnants. Now I need to stop dicking about and get that cell tower cleared. Unfortunately, though, it's still threatened by two player cards. Well, you know what they say, you can't make an omelette without breaking some eggs. Oh my god, Jesus! <laughs> I get back to my car with a horde quite literally hot on my tail. Yes, that is a burning zombie joke. What can I say? My comedic genius knows no bounds. But now Beta can make his way to the next player cart. I find it at this little house and once again park strategically. I'm sure you'll agree it worked out so well last time. Now it's time for Beta to get to work. He pops a stim and a second scent block, which leaves him very close to permanent infection. And remember, there's no cure in this mod, which means I'm going to have to be extra careful with my player cart phasing. The last thing I want to do is accidentally gas my Myself leaving Beta on the dead heap with Alpha, Dwight, Glenn, Rosita and Abraham. Holy shit, this mod is fucking brutal. And I didn't even include Sasha or Eugene in those statistics. The second phase goes down pretty simply and to be honest, so does the third. You gotta love scent block, am I right? I can then do a quick little tidy up so I don't get surprised bit. I then do a little bit of looted. But there's no time to be resting on our laurels, especially when we have a scent block active. We've gotta get cracking if we really wanna make the most of it. The next play cart is located in this medical centre and there's no way to cheat this one. Assuming you don't already count scent block as cheesing, I enter what I'm now realising is the veterinary clinic, and thankfully there's only a couple of walkers about, but with the scent block still active, I'm left perfectly alone to get the first phase off with my heavy weapon. I then wait for the gases to dissipate and go back in and get the second phase finished. And at this point, quite a sizeable crowd has gathered. Well, it's a bloody good thing I stink like the dead. Look at them, they're so confused, don't have a fucking clue what's going on. Thankfully, the stink sticks around for a little bit longer and I'm able to take out the play card. I obviously have time to do a cheeky bit of looting, then it's finally time to fix that pissing cell tower. Which it turns out is incredibly easy to do. It turns out all I've got to do is walk vaguely near it. Secured, and radio silence has been completed. Now I need all these zombies to piss off, please. Thank you very much. I then decide to try my luck for a toolkit by searching this warehouse. But what can I say? I'm not a lucky boy. So instead I set my sights on setting a nearby petrol station as an outpost. There's just one problem. There's a metric ton of fuckheads between me and it. But thanks to my extreme tactical intellect, I can attract them all over to me with my rifle shots. I can then do a little bit of backtracking like a cancelled comedian. Yes, they're surrounding the car, but that's fine. I've got plans for that. And putting plenty of obstacles between me and the horde means I'm relatively safe. That is until I spot a second horde, of course. But they too are also easily confused thanks to Beta being a speedy boy. I can then rather covertly get into the petrol station and claim it as an outpost. And from there, you can probably figure out exactly what I did next. You gotta love an incendiary minefield. <laughs> Alright, yes, I can't wrap my Welsh tongue around the phrase incinerary. If anyone makes fun of my accent in the comment section, I'll become your new stepdad. Sorry, that's basically a convoluted way of saying I'm gonna smash the absolute shit out of your mothers. Also, how sick are my reversing skills? That wasn't the smartest idea. The car's smoking heavier than a pregnant teenager from Newport. But at least I get to listen to the soothing ASMR calming tones of walkers being detonated by my minefield. I can then sort out my inventory for five before swapping to Daryl. And a landmine protected outpost is the perfect mini base to branch out from on a looting quest. And that includes looting the shed and Daryl's pretty certain there used to be an enclave here. Weird, right? I guess they must have moved out of town or something. But then Daryl starts to get a bit cocky by taunting zombies over to his minefield. It starts with me accidentally selecting the wrong emote and Daryl just stands there crying. No, 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 no! 
Jesus! God damn, that was a lot closer than I care to admit. And the last thing we want to do is lose a fan favourite, am I right? I shit my pants, I thought that was Daryl dead. And after that close call, it's time to move on to a different quest. As Daryl wants to finally reunite with his brother Merle. So he rocks up to the colony of survivors where Merle is living at. But unfortunately, Merle still refuses to be recruited. Why won't you allow me to recruit you, you moron? Why won't you join your brother? So instead, Daryl decides to pay a visit to a local trader. And I'll be honest, I'm proper desperate for a toolkit. But unfortunately, this trader is... Alexis Carter from the network, and she's about as useful as a bloody chocolate teapot. Why could you not have a toolkit on you? Daryl takes this as well as could be expected. Hey, check me out! And with the hordes closing in on Miss Carter, it's time to get the hell out of Dodge. Still looking for something that can repair this beast. And before people comment telling me why don't I bloody make them, unfortunately none of the Walking Dead characters I can recruit can learn the mechanic skill. So instead I head to this power station, but unfortunately all I find is scraps of circuitry. Speaking of scraps, Daryl gets into one. But there's not much Daryl can't deal with, especially when he has a repeating crossbow. Has Daryl ever missed a crossbow bolt? I don't think he has. Next up, we're gonna search the water utility place just up the road. Unfortunately though, the pickup takes an extra smidge of damage on my escape, and well, at least Daryl can get his fire starter's badge. Little fire, little fire's fine, I think. In hindsight, I probably should have walked. I would have saved some petrol, got a good bit of exercise, and well, my car quite literally wouldn't be on its last legs. But gratefully, I'm finally able to find a toolkit. Yes, we got a toolkit! Fine, yes. The only problem I have now is walkers storming my location. As you can see, there's quite a few of the bastards right where I don't want them. The only resemblance of a plan I have is to lure them away from the car, and to avoid attracting any other large gatherings to my vicinity. Rather surprisingly, the plan works out alright. The car gets repaired, although unfortunately still smoking, but at least clear smoke is better than certain death. After that, Daryl heads back to base, but it's just a pit stop to unload and refuel. Then Daryl heads out on a little quest to make the neighbourhood a bit safer, armed with his repeating cross crossbow, but mainly three molotovs. As the kids would say, this shit is about to get lit as fuck. Firstly, I use my crossbow to lure them all into one location, although that didn't really work, and if anything, has split the horde into two. Ah, oh, well, you know what they say, in for a penny, time to burn the faces of the undead. But it's fair to say that molly throw certainly wasn't my best. And now Daryl's gotta fight off an entire horde that is aware of his location. Thankfully, I was still packing another two mollies. I really don't want them attacking my home. No, in my luck, someone like Rick will die, and I don't want Rick dying. Kind of important to the story we got going on. Daryl being the beast he is, he can fight off the hordes. Although it still annoys me that Daryl Dixon doesn't have bloody gunslinger. In the end, I go back to the sneaky approach scene as these walkers have a worse attention span than an ADHD kid with a clicker pen. My new plan is to refuel this abandoned pickup and then to lead the hordes away. And rather surprisingly, this actually works out alright. Oh, no, 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 no. Alright, yes, it almost ends in disaster. But almost isn't a defining trait. Nobody remembers the kid from school who almost shit his pants. Luring the hordes away was actually massively sick. Successful. Unlike the time I ate a whole pack of sugar-free mints in your eight, but enough of rectum failure, I'm forced north with walkers hot on my tail. Which isn't exactly a bad thing, as there's an enclave up here that needs welcoming. Excellent reflexes, my friend. It turns out these guys have been on the run for weeks and are currently starving. No idea why the lazy pricks couldn't check the bar not even a stone's throw away from them. But yeah, sure, I guess I'll help you out, but... Although it seems my loud engine may have attracted some nearby walkers. And I don't mean the kind Gary Lineker shags. The crowds force me through the back door, like it's that time of the month and it seems I've been here before. The barn that is not a stranger's anal cavity. With the population swelling the longer I linger, I decide it's probably best to retreat. At the end of the day, I've got a ton of food back at base, I'll just grab a rucksack from there. Although it seems I've forgotten about the horde I led away from base earlier, as I'm now leading the bastards back towards base. And it certainly doesn't help my community members don't mind whipping out an automatic rifle. No, 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 beta, no, beta, don't go, don't do it! Unable to handle this with 10 cross crossbow bolts, I retreat to the supply locker to pick up something a bit heavier. God no, this could get messy. But in my panic state, the only thing I managed to pick up was a fuel bomb. And typically that means everybody's gotta get their eyebrows singed. And that turns out to be particularly bad for one of our members. Rick is now frustrated due to low morale. Rick, this is your community. Imagine your leader being frustrated because of his own leadership skills. That is unfortunately when it happens. Beta is fighting off the horde when the final walker lunges for his throat. No! No! Oh my god, I just saved Beta! I just saved Beta! Well, who had Daryl saving Beta on their Walking Dead bingo card? I certainly bloody didn't. And with that whole dealt with, I'm starting to see this community has the strength and the numbers to make the apocalypse our bitch. But the only way we beat the undead is together. So Daryl pulls out a rucksack of food from our storage. Then he drives back north to the exhausted survivors, ignoring the optional quest to talk to Alpha about it. Apparently, Daryl left his Ouija board at home. He can then give the strangers a sack of food, then check out 
if they have anything to trade. Apparently not. But hey, at least it's double ply. After that, we are back to base to give Daryl a rest. But before he gets a chance to rest, another wandering horde threatens our safety. But Daryl learned his mistake from earlier. With a molly thrown perfectly into the center of the horde, they all charge towards him. But with them already burning, it's too little too late. That worked actually amazingly. Daryl can then finally rest and we take over as Rick. And as the sheriff, Rick wants to gain allies to assist us in fighting the blood plague. Beta, on the other hand, disagrees. But what the fuck does that prick know? He stinks like the dead and wears the face of a zombie for fuck's sake. Rick knows we need to help people. So Rick heads to the home of the determined, but comes across a large horde just meters away from their home. I, I'm not doing it to be doing a very good job of winning allies here when I lead a massive horde to these people. So I park around the corner to hopefully keep them safe. I then make up the remaining distance on foot to talk to Dryad. Hey, will you stop running away, you prick? Honest to God. Dryad needs a hand taking down a local infestation and unfortunately insists on coming along for the ride. So with her chilling in the back of the pickup, we make our way over to the infestation, but you can probably figure out how this one's gonna end. Oh. Wait, ah, oh, it crashed! Not an ideal situation to be in, but at least the game spawned me on top of the car. And apparently the determined no longer need our help. This time I've gotta help out a group that go by the locals. And oh my god, what a fucking shit name for an enclave. It's the apocalypse for fuck's sake, eat as much calories as you want like. So I arrive at the home of the Weight Watching pricks, and head inside to introduce myself. Uh... Oh my god. Oh my- No! No! Rick! No, Rick! My silence is more than I ever could. My leader, our protagonist, and our hope for this entire run reanimates on the floor of strangers. Can I get an RIP for Ricky Dicky Doodah Grimes in the comment section? Better dead than Zed, I suppose. I mean, that's not filling me with joy, Beta, but yeah, nice nice one for me. Honest to God. Actually, Rick was bit. He reanimated in front of my very eyes. Beta is properly thick as shit, but he is a highly effective use of muscle. So I take over as him and head off to destroy the remaining play cards. Unfortunately, though, we don't get particularly far, as some idiot forgot to refuel. But at least he managed to pull over to the side of the road to allow traffic to pass. Oh my God, I didn't even put any healables onto him. What is going on with me? Panicked and disorganized after the untimely loss of our leader, Beta searches a nearby house for fuel. But unsurprisingly, people didn't used to keep diesel fuel in their kitchen cupboards. Seeing as he's near the home of the determined, he pops in to see if they have any fuel. They don't, but I will take that toolkit, thank you very much. I also find an ambulance nearby, and you might have guessed I'm starting to get desperate. This being lethal zone, it's obviously out of fuel, and just like I suspected, the only thing in the back was things I could use to save my life. Now the plan is simple. Get 600 meters over a river, around a mountain, and to Rick's dead body. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Also, I've got no stamina items because I'm a moron. Can Beta make the death defying trip? Can he avoid hundreds of walkers along the way without a single energy drink to quench his first? This could be Beta's biggest challenge yet, or barely an inconvenience, which he does in record time. After unloading the heavier items in the back of Rick's pickup, Beta enters the home of the locals to pay respects to his leader. Oh, hey. Come on in if you want. Oh, thanks, mate. You're very jolly considering you have, like, one of my community members just laid out on your kitchen floor, like, you know? Not even mentioning his own mate just lying inches away. To be honest, I'm just happy he didn't go through Rick's pockets and help himself to any of the valuable shit he had on him. After Beta has paid his respects and flogged all of the dead guy shit back to the enclave, now it's time to crack on with the play cards and always make sure to park strategically. It has literally never gone wrong. Beta pops an energy drink and then headbutts his way through a glass window. The play cart is located in this store cupboard and it's time to start battering it with his heavy axe. Although he can't quite get the phase before the hordes catch up to him. But by dodging his way through the crowds, he can stun the walkers. This is very risky playing uh, this mod. And you know what? Sometimes all you gotta do is just set literally everything on fire. That molly does a fantastic job of clearing the crowd. Then Beta can go in and finally get the first phase off. Obviously dropping a second molly on his retreat. And from here, Beta finishes off the heart from the roof of the pickup. The next play cart is literally just across the road. So I decide to make the journey on foot. Like I've said previously, Master Tap. Tactician, am I right? And by closing the door behind me, I managed to get the first phase off before the hordes catch up to me. I then escape through the back and toss a molly behind me. Then for some reason, I spot a ladder and have to climb it. It's just kind of what I do. Well, look at that. And now, uh, Beta could just sit up here for the rest of eternity. Never worrying. Ever again. Okay, well, technically that's a lie, but at least there's a second ladder I can climb down. I slam my way into the ice cream shop like a bull in a china shop to make as much noise as possible to hopefully draw the crowds out from the play cart. But to be honest, it seems like I didn't need to. And with the 
be here next to no foot traffic, I can easily get the second phase off, and then move to the other side of the shop where I get the killer blow. And just like that, Beta is starting to solidify himself as potentially the next leader of the Rectatorship. But it's best not to rest on our laurels. The sun has risen and a new day is upon us. It's time for Beta to end the Blood Plague. There might still be several hearts left, but nothing can stop us now. Our boy Beta is flying high. We start like we always do by battering the heart with a heavy weapon. That is until the hordes catch up to us. No, 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 no. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. I didn't think this one through. My problem really is I'm completely out of stamina, and all I've got is a pack of fridge raiders to keep me going. They are slower, they are duller. I can't outsmart them. No, I can't. What am I on about? I can't outsmart anything. I then climb onto the car and pop a couple of shots with the rifle, and that allows my stamina to regenerate. I successfully get the first phase off with my single shot rifle, and then it's time to get right back into the heavy action. I hit it a few more times until it phases, and drop a soda can bomb. I can then limp my way out of the open window, again with no stamina. And seeing as the crowd in the the warehouse are getting a bit out of control. I go for a little runabout to try and lure them all outside. But I unfortunately get distracted talking to the mod creator in my livestream chat. Uh, I've tried getting rid of these runners, but I've been proving difficult to get rid of. Ah, fair enough. Oh, but no! No! Another life taken too soon due to my lapse in concentration. Can I get an RIP for beta in the comment section? Well, that's rough. And we're back to the press chat. And then there were two. Although neither of our heroes have high enough standing to become supreme leader in Rick's absence. We also have no vehicle as beta took it out and hasn't been seen since. Robin bastard. So it's just a casual 1100 meter trek across to the other side of the map to receive another set of wheels. While also trying to avoid being eaten alive by the frankly ridiculous amounts of the undead. But we do get there and it's a good thing I remembered to grab a jerry can, as this tank was drier than Trump's missus. And seeing as there's only two of us left, Harold decides it's time to make some friends. In the shape of Rick's former family. Although a loud engine accidentally leads a gigantic hole to their front door. Probably not a fantastic start to the trade negotiations. Especially as the only thing I'm looking to trade is human lives. Anyway, once they've either been burned alive or lured away, Daryl heads into the shed to say hello. We have Shane, Carl and Laurie to choose from. But it seems Shane's the only one happy to join the team, and doesn't even think twice about abandoning Rick's family. Damn, now that's what we call a father figure. We can then give our newbie Shane a lift back home. But just as we're getting home, we may have attracted the attention of a nearby horde of walkers. Shane, yep. I'm just going to dismiss you a second. And with Shane out of harm's way, Daryl is free to mow down the hordes with the arse of his brand new car. Shane then decides he needs to prove himself to his new comrades. So once his pockets are stuffed with the community's resources, he also borrows the car and heads off to investigate the theft of some stolen medical supplies. Shane is not built to be governed and he wants to lead this group so it's important everything goes well. So he heads in to speak to Joe who's like, we were attacked and robbed, any chance you can help us out big lad. And Shane's like, I sound but no problem. But we certainly ain't taking any risks so we're gonna rock up, shoot first and nobody ask a single bloody question, alright? And rather foolishly these fellas have set up base in a construction site which doesn't even have walls. But that doesn't stop Joe from being immediately one shot. But Shane isn't so easily dealt with. Although admittedly we do get a close call but it was never really gonna be enough to take down Big Shane. A mixture of loud gunshots and firecrackers draws in hordes of walkers which promptly deals with the threat. But those guys had valuable medical supplies on them so I can't just retreat. First I lead the hordes away before looping back round and collecting them. Ah, okay, I guess this guy didn't have them. And it seems like the guy who did have them has reanimated and wandered off somewhere. Bloody typical. So we're gonna have to head back to break the news about Joe with our hands empty. He's like, where's Joe? I don't see him. And I'm like, he got immediately annihilated. But don't worry, he was screaming in excruciating pain for little over two and a half minutes. What the fuck? Anyway, I reject his offer to join us as I'm pretty sure he was never in an episode of The Walking Dead. And with that, we have another enclave asking for food and Shane works part-time on the weekends for Deliveroo. So he's probably the only character we have that's qualified for such a mission. Although that almost ends in immediate disaster. Oh no! Jesus, oh my god. Someone almost getting instantly bit after only five minutes of recruitment? Nah, mate, never happened before. As revenge for them almost letting me succumb to my own stupidity, I'm like, no food for you, son. But interestingly, they will trade me for a repair kit even though I'm now letting them starve. Questionable decision on their part, I'm sure you'll agree. And with that, it's time for Shane to really prove his worth by taking on a play card. And interestingly, there's another vehicle here that looks quite familiar. But what's not so interesting is the amount of the undead that's been attracted by the noise of my engine. Shane should have invested in a Tesla. So he plants a firework around the back to hopefully distract the hordes before starting the assault from the front of the warehouse. But we needn't have worried as two swings kills the play card. I guess Shane really is just built different. I'm sure you'll agree 
agree he'd make an excellent leader for this gang of outcasts. Shane then destroys another nearby heart pretty simply before heading south towards Limestone to meet the neighbours. Shane then meets a girl named Sophie and she asks if he'd speak to some nearby knobheads to get them to be less knobheadish. And Shane's like, well, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours if you know what I mean. Oh, definitely. So together they head to take on a nearby player card. Although weirdly during the assault, she just stops following us. Christ's sake, Sophie, as if I don't have enough abandonment issues. Anyway, even being on his own, Shane is such a beast the play card doesn't stand a chance. Oh no! Shane! R.I.P. Shane, I can't believe another soul has been taken too soon in the prime of their life. So the question resets. Which of these two will become the legend who leads the dictatorship to safety? We take over as Michonne, and if I'm being honest with you, we're right back to square one. No car, and over 2,000 meters away to get our old one back. Good thing Michonne is one fit lass. Although we get very lucky about halfway through our journey as we come across one of our old abandoned cars. So I grab ourselves a jerry can from a nearby shed, and we're good to go. Providing you ignore the cancerous fumes we've got to inhale en route, of course. Then we can head to the play cart where Shane got bit, and even though his reanimated corpse is nowhere to be seen, we take down the plague art with only a few swings of a heavy shovel Michonne found on a corpse nearby. Although it certainly is a shame we couldn't say a final goodbye to Shane, as he had a toolkit in his back pocket. But hey, that's alright, his old working car will do just fine. It's also got a couple of sacks of resources in the back. Michonne then moves on to the next plague art, which is in this concrete factory, and it's basically a freebie if you block the main entrance with a vehicle. Okay, well maybe that's not quite true, but I do complete the first phase before I get overrun, and after lead away more walkers than I've ever seen in my life. Now that's a bloody horde. But with a gentle bit of manoeuvring, even with a sack of meds on her back, it's not too much longer before Michonne claims victory over the play card. Although if I'm being honest, the escape definitely could have been executed with a bit more finesse. I suppose that's what happens when you try reversing through 60 walkers. So it looks like we'll be escaping in the old battered pickup truck. But we don't go too far as there's another play card to take on. And you'll notice I still haven't had a chance to drop this bloody sack of medical supplies. What can I say? You don't get a lot of time to do anything in this mod. It's a constant barrage of walker hordes. It's both challenging and annoying, and I love every second of it. But inevitably, it too shall fall to Michonne's might. And to celebrate, we make her the leader with only one play cart left on the map. And that is what we immediately head for now. One more heart to save the entirety of Cascade Hills from the Blood Plague. The heart is located in the bathroom, which is both good and bad, as there's only one entrance to be attacked from. However, it does make it rather tricky to escape from when it phases and spews out all of its gases. And with that, it's time to lead the several hordes that I've gathered away so I can get back in there. And you'll notice I've traded the medical sack for an ammo sack. I never learn, do I? As you can see, leading the hordes away helped massively. But whatever, that's the second phase. And using the same strat as previous, it's not too long before we finish the heart completely. And with that final swing of her shovel, Michonne has saved Cascade Hills from the Blood Plague. And with that, it's time to head home as she's starting to get a little sleepy. So we take over as Daryl, who has decided we need to recruit some fresh faces. He can make his way over to the, the survivors, and after a quick clear up of the neighbourhood, he recruits Maggie Green to the dictatorship. He then drops her safely back to base where we take over as Michonne, as it seems a local has gone missing. She's also found herself a lovely new burninator. How class is that? So we head to the villagers and speak to Lee, who's like, I'm really worried about the motel hoppers. And at first I'm like, what the bloody hell's that got to do with me? I've never even met the pricks. Then Lee reminds me I did self-proclaim myself as the sheriff, so it is kind of my job. Alright, fair enough, hop in the back, son. Unfortunately the motel hoppers have all turned, but I do find a note with coordinates labelled Rally Point. Which is proper strange in all honesty, I can't believe people are hosting a race and I wasn't invited. But it just gets worse. I get to the coordinates and there's no sign of a race whatsoever. Just another note labelled Potential Targets. And right on cue, the other villagers radio are saying they're being attacked and we have to rush back to save them. Don't get me wrong, it's gonna be tricky, but by sticking together we can eliminate the hostile threat. Unfortunately, however, Lee dies immediately. I guess he won't get a chance to save Clementine in this universe. The raiders fall surprisingly easily, and now we need to go check in on the other enclaves around the map. But unfortunately, this is a journey that Michonne will not make to her final destination. She's forced to pull over as we're low on fuel. She's able to find a bundle of biodiesel in the fire station nearby, but unfortunately she gets swarmed while having no stamina. Oh no 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 no! no! <laughs> R.I.P. Michonne, you certainly deserved better. Unfortunately, this is where things get even more difficult, as Daryl isn't even a citizen yet and can't become a leader. And with no play cards left and zero freaks in the game, we might struggle to raise it far enough to become a leader. And fully committed to the final stand with two characters, we've enlisted Maggie to come along for the help. Which I'd say goes about as well as you'd expect. And again, and again. 
Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, shit. R.I.P. Maggie, I hope you find Glenn in the afterlife. But unfortunately, we're going to have to recruit a replacement as Daryl is a warlord and the legacy missions can't spawn if there's only one character. So please welcome Carol to the Rectatorship. So once Carol is safety tucked in back at base, Daryl agrees to help out an abandoned soldier who's pinned down. Although I'd say this guy was definitely over-egging the pudding when he said he was pinned down, there's no fucker here, man. I agreed to give him a lift, although I then immediately beat the pickup and that results in Gonzalez becoming a light morning snack. That could have gone better, couldn't it? So it looks like we're gonna have to think of another plan to increase our standing. Another way we can increase our standing is by depositing resource rucksacks back at base. So with no mission spawning, I decide that might be the best way to do things. Although I find precisely fuck all in this veterinary clinic. No, I don't want soap, I want standing, you dickheads. So I spend the next 20 minutes looting all I can from the local area around my outpost before heading off on foot to clear some infestations. Very easily, may I? I add, or whatever, as long as it works. Unfortunately, that doesn't have a massive impact on my standing. So it's back to work. Daryl focuses on his tirade against the walker population, travelling from site to site, eliminating infestation after infestation, before heading home as he's getting sleepy and depositing all the rucksacks he's gathered, but we're still agonisingly short. So it's time for Carol Peltier to take over for five. She wanders all over the map, again collecting as many rucksacks as she can so Daryl can increase his standing. What a woman, sacrificing her own potential leadership career for a friend. After very carefully only depositing the regular loot, she turns her attention towards the hordes that have gathered around their home site. One flare gathers them all into a neat pile, then a follow-up molly removes them from existence. <laughs> <laughs> die, my pretties, die. There's also a second horde slightly to the south, and Carol reckons she can do an even better job. Again, another flare lures them into the middle of the road. She then throws another molly, but this time landing right in the centre of the horde. There we go. That's it. Look at that. Don't come running towards me, son. And with the hordes fully extinguished and Daryl fully rested, it's now his time to shine. And he goes straight back to clearing infestations until there's simply no more. And with that, he finally has enough standing to become our leader. And unfortunately, at this point, we get raiders ransacking our town. And Daryl is once again shattered from all the walker slaying, so it's back to Carol to deal with the threat. She drifts into their back garden or throws a firecracker through the window. And then she can just sit back from the safety of her battered pickup and watch as the hostiles get almost instantly eviscerated from the hordes of walkers. But something about that interaction awoke a deep desire within Carol. Did she enjoy the power of holding other people's lives in the palm of her hand? Or was it the ability to control an entire force of the undead? There was only one way to be sure. So she pays a visit to the, the survivors, and with them unaware of her presence, she creeps into their downstairs living quarters and plants a remote-controlled boombox. And from the safety of her pickup, she listens to the blaring rock music that's attracted dozens and dozens of walkers to their base. It's not a pretty sight as hordes rip through their home and the screams of characters we've known and loved slowly fizzle away into the groans of walkers. And Carol did learn something about herself. She really did enjoy the power of having other people's lives in the palm of her hand. So she decides to pay a visit to the villagers who were only around the corner. And even though the pickup takes too much damage, the following explosion just leads even more hordes to their home. And in the end, they're just another enclave that falls to Carol Peltier. Meanwhile, back at base, our leader Daryl is just just chilling. No coalition forms to overthrow him, and he's just living his best life not knowing his mate is committing war crimes at an unfathomable rate. So Carol continues her lust for blood, this time heading south towards Limestone, where we have the flaming badasses, an enclave we haven't met yet. But Carol greets them with a firecracker, then once again sits in safety and watches the bloodshed before her very eyes. Her next target are the Gleaners, but they don't put up much of any kind of fight. Each enclave that falls, she discovers something new about herself. It's not just the bloodshed, it's the struggle, the clinging to life that she enjoys. So her next trip is to the My Family, an enclave of a woman and her slightly pubescent son. And oh boy does she enjoy this encounter. There must have been 30 plus walkers beating down this helpless woman and her child, but they keep fighting for over two and a half minutes. But unfortunately no one can withstand that kind of beating forever. So with Carol's body count now well into double figures, she takes a step too far, heading to the colony of survivors. That's where Daryl's brother Merle is currently living. And sadly for Daryl, they too fall under Carol's warpath. And once word hits Daryl of his brother's demise, he simply can't trust Carol any longer. Although fearing her wrath, he must become cunning, enlisting her help to take down a small gathering outside, although this time he allows her to fall. R.I.P. Carol, you 
bleeding psychopath. But Daryl can't allow her to wander for eternity. He decides he has to put her down. However, it seems Carol has one more victim to claim. R.I.P. Daryl, R.I.P. Community, and I guess the real state of decay was the walking dead all along. Well, that's a plot twist.